All right, and now we're recording. Pick someone randomly to give the, well, why don't you start, Tobias? Just introduce yourself and talk about what you're doing with Java. <laughs> okay, my name is Tobias Frech, and I'm uh, helping administrators to better run the Java applications. Most of you guys develop, and that's a good opportunity to think about the guys that have to run that stuff for 10 years after you developed one year on it. So put a more, some more log statements in and make an <laughs> admin console and something like that. So a lot of people will be happy about that. Okay, good job. That's a good example. Pass the mic to someone randomly and yeah. <laughs> All right, guy holding the mic, your turn. <laughs> okay. It's a hot potato. Um, what was the question again? Just mention your... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Mention um, your name and then talk about what you're doing with Java. My, my name is uh, Dimitrios Klis and um, I basically um, uh, implement uh, web applications and um, I don't know what... Um, <laughs> um, yes, that's... <laughs> okay, good. That's basically it, yeah. All right, pass the mic to this side of the room. These guys are getting off easy. <laughs> All right, go, go, you. Okay. Hi, my name is Laszlo Bednarik. I'm working at uh, HP in a... In a backup software, developing a middleware layer that's based on Java. Cool. So, yeah. Thank you. And let's do one more person. Pass it forward. <laughs> Tell me it again. Oh, okay. I know you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this time the recording works. My name is Dominic. I'm a senior consultant and developing different kinds of web applications and publishing stuff on security, giving talks about it. Nice, yeah. We, we had a ni very nice interview at Javaland, which unfortunately my battery died during, so we, we people at Javaland enjoyed it, but we didn't get the recording. My apologies. Okay, so thanks very much. Pass the mic back to Tobias. He'll be the mic guy for the session. All right, and just give me a sec to attempt to, it's my turn to get on camera. Do, I think it should be about right. All right, so what we're gonna do today is um, look at a whole bunch of different things which use the new Java 8 release. Does anyone know when the Java 8 release came out? Okay, so yeah, the launch party, the official announcement was, we actually did it at Java Land on the 25th. And the software was released a few days earlier. I don't know the exact date, but it was um, last week. So it is now out. You can get the very latest Java software. And there's lots of cool features in Java 8 that you want to take advantage of in your, in your applications. Here's just a, a few of them. So does anybody looking forward to lambdas? Java lambdas? Yes. That's probably the biggest and most well-known feature in Java 8. Um, how about NASHORN? Anyone know what NASHORN is? Just shout it out. Yeah. So JavaScript running on the JVM, much higher performance than Rhino, which was an interpreter for JavaScript. Um, and even with Project Avatar, you can run Node.js applications on Java EE servers like Glassfish. Um, improvements to the core libraries, parallel performance, collections. We're going to look at the Streams API. A um, bunch of JVM enhancements. Is anybody sad to see permgen go away? <laughs> you're, you're sad, Tobias? Yeah, I am. <laughs> All right, you're in the minority, I think. 
Um, a whole bunch of new Unicode enhancements. Very exciting stuff. We're not going to talk about that. Um, and then a whole bunch of JavaFX as well. JavaFX 3D and um, print APIs and a bunch of things people have been waiting for. Finally, tooling and some security enhancements. But what we'll focus on in this session is specifically Lambdas and streaming APIs and also the ability to run Java on ARM-based devices. So the Lambdas includes kind of three different aspects. One is the language changes. So there's a whole new syntax in Java for running Lambdas. There is also libraries that go along with it. So you can use the Lambdas libraries along with um, the Lambdas language feature. And we'll show you streams and some other stuff which have been added to the Java APIs. And also JVM changes. The, um, Invoke Dynamic was added in Java 7, but they enhanced it for Java 8 to give better performance for lambdas. Um, and also default methods, which we'll talk about, or extension methods required some changes. Um, oh yeah, this is outdated, it's now released. But get the latest Java version. And there's really good IDE support as well. All the major IDEs support lambdas. So, we, we need a, um, I'm tired of the camera being pointed at me. We need an audience shot. So sh give a show of hands for who is an Eclipse user in the audience? Yeah? <laughs> OK, that's, that's a lot. Who's a NetBeans user? OK, OK. And finally, who likes IntelliJ? OK. So you know, good mix, lots of Eclipse users. Has anyone tried the Eclipse support for lambdas yet? No, no, yes. How, how, how's it, your experience so far? Works well, yeah. So um, Eclipse has good support, yeah. And NetBeans as well has had support for a while. Um, and IntelliJ is good as well, and that's what I'll be using for the presentation. Um, so showing you a little bit of coding in IntelliJ using lambdas. So you guys are saved, it's back to me. Okay. All right, so this is what a um, for loop looks like in Java 7, right? For iterating over a, a list of shapes, um, changing the color from blue to red. This is what the same code looks like if you use the new for each method and a lambda expression in Java 8. So basically it does the same thing. You can see the basic syntax of a lambda expression. The parameters are on the left side of the, the dash greater than sign. On the right side is a code block, which is in um, squiggly braces. And um, the same code is executed in both cases and we'll get similar performance. So we added a new method there, right, for each, but isn't that going to produce a problem to add a new method for each on, on the collections class? <coughs> what, if, what if you have a, your own library which implements collections and it doesn't have a for each method specified? What happens to your code? Yeah, so, so apparently the, the JVM team, the, the Java core team, just broke backwards compatibility with all the Java developers in the world, right? <laughs> Ah, oh, okay. Somebody knows about default methods. Very good device. So what they actually did to, to make the for each method work for um, user's code is they provided a default implementation of the for each method. So if you don't implement this in your own class, then you'll automatically get this implementation of for each added to your code. And you can do the same thing in your code. So whenever you have an interface, now you can add implementations which, if not overridden, will give you a default implementation. And this solves the problem of um, backwards compatibility, which has kind of plagued um, APIs in Java for quite a while. So that's a little bit about extension methods. And then getting back to the Lambda syntax, this is the 
kind of a step-by-step -step guide through the different types of lambda expressions you can create. So at the very top is um, the full form lambda, right? So you put parentheses, comma separated list of parameters, and you put the types on each of them. And the right side, you know, squiggly brackets, and then a statement um, or series of statements, and the last one can optionally return something. If you want to, you can leave off the types, and it will type inference. Type inferencing will figure out the types for you. So that's the, the second line. And if you're just returning a value, you can also leave off, as a convenience, the squiggly braces and the, um, the curly braces and the return and the semicolon. On the third line is an example with a single parameter expression where you can even leave off the parentheses. Um, if you have zero arguments, you actually need the parentheses. I think the, the Java core team calls that the, um, the hamburger operator. What's the, what's the German word for hamburger? <laughs> hamburger. <laughs> All right, I know two words in German now. Guten Tag, hamburger. Um, okay, and the last one simply print out something. That's common if you were, for example, um, doing a callback or implementing a runnable or something. So there you have it. You guys now know lambdas. Easy, right? All right, so this, this actually, this covers writing full form lambda expressions. But what you're going to see in a lot of code is they use these things called method references as a shorthand syntax. So the way this works is on the, the right hand side is the full lambda expression. And on the left-hand side is the method reference, which is a shortcut for the same thing. So you know you could write the full one, but the method reference is a shorter form of the same thing. So starting from the top, where's our mic guy? Mic guy. Pass the mic to somebody. Yeah, OK. So what, what do you think that first guy is there? What type of method reference? Uh, What's it doing? I have no idea, actually. <laughs> you have no idea. Take, take a guess. So you can see the lambda expression, right? <coughs> so that's doing, um, calling a static method on objects. Yeah, printing the string, uh, string of object, of the object. Yeah, yeah so that prints it out. To a string method of the object. And um, the parameter passed in is the object to, to be applied to. And then, you know. So it's basically a, a static class method reference. Okay, so pass the mic to someone else for the second one. Anyone want to try? Number two. All right, you. <laughs> uh, so the second line, uh, also no idea. Uh, the left side is also a reference to the to string method, something like Zect, I think. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the right side, it's uh, uh, no, no so calls it to string method of, of an object. Yeah, so what's different about the first and the second one? The S. <laughs> well, that, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it is uh, the S. Seems the f the first one calls a static method and the um, second, second one's one a member, member member method. Yeah, so, and the S is the difference because objects has a bunch of static methods. It's a factory class which was added in Java eight. Um, um, so in, in essence, the the main difference between the two is the first one will never throw a null pointer exception because the objects method will check for null. In the second one, if you go through a stream and you have a null in there, you could get a null pointer exception because it's just going to call two string on the methods. All right, third one. Pass the mic. Oh, good catch. That would have been an expensive mistake. Um, don't know. I think you don't have any parameters. So what is the object? Uh, yeah, OK, so that's good, right? There's no parameters to the lambda. And on the left there, you can see it's referring to a specific object. Ah, OK. So it's calling to a string of the specific object. Yeah, okay. very good. 
So you can also make, besides making method reference to classes, you can also put a method reference and specify an object, and it will call that method on that particular object. And the parameter is if there are any, two string doesn't have any, would be the parameters to the lambda expression. Okay, you're doing good. And who wants the last one? Pass it one row back, first person. <laughs> I don't have a clue, but it seems to be a very generalized approach because no parameters and just, let's say, creating a very generalized uh, uh, instance of object class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think this is the key right here. New. So the last one is a, an example of a constructor method reference, right? It's always going to call the equivalent constructor for that class. Okay. So now you guys know the four types of method references. What if I have more than one parameter? Ah, okay. Good question. What if you have more than one parameter? If you have more than one parameter, then your lambda expression will have multiple parameters. Right, so whatever the parameters for the function are, translate into the parameters for the lambda expression after the object gets passed in for the first two. So you, could, you, know, you can use method references, and you can also use the full form lambda expressions. I'll show you examples of both when we're going through some code. All right, and the last bit of syntax you need to know, and then your um, lambda gurus, is functional interfaces. So functional interfaces are a special case yeah, looks about right, of a type of interface where it has a single abstract method. So you can see here the functional interface um, is an annotation. You add it to existing interfaces or new interfaces. Um, and the way of thinking about it is it's kind of like the overrides annotation that got added in. Um, you don't need to specify functional interface. It's optional. But if you do, the compiler will give you an error if the interface you've annotated is not a functional interface. And this is how you type your methods which accept lambda expressions. So, you know, for example, if you wanted to have a accept something which was going to add a few integers, then you could have this um, sum interface and then say your, your method expects a sum, and then you could pass in a lambda expression as long as it would take two integers and return an integer. So, any questions so far? You guys ready? Yeah. All right, let's look at a simple example. This is a JavaFX example. And we're going to take the application and lambdaize it. All right, so I've got a little application with some circles which are um, you know, rotating around here. When you mouse over them, it highlights the, you know, the, the border by making the, um, giving a stroke. So that's an, a, a um, binding. When you click on it, it makes it disappear. So that's the, the vanishing part. And all of this is like not much code. So it's a good example for us to look at and see what we can do with lambdas. OK, so here's the basic <coughs> application skeleton, you know, traditional JavaFX um, main method application at launch, all that stuff. So nothing particularly exciting. What is probably interesting is the stuff in red, creating the circles and beginning the animation. So to create the circles, we're going over a for loop, creating 50 circles, and then giving them kind of a random location and a random color. So what can we, what can we do with this to lambdaize this? Any ideas? So for each, I heard someone. Okay, circles dot for each. Yeah, so that's close. The problem is um, for each iterates over a existing collection, and since our collection's empty, 
then we won't actually iterate over it. Um, there's the methods in the um, generate or the streams API which help us. So if you use the generate method, what it will do is it takes a lambda expression, the lambda expression evaluates to an object, and then it will create a, an infinite stream of objects. Um, since lambdas are lazy, or streams are lazy, what this essentially does is it, it gives us a collection and we can call limit to limit it to the number of elements we want, so 50 circles, and then you know, return it back to a list, so collectors.to list. So that, that works. Um, I wouldn't really recommend it because it's, <laughs> it's not any easier than our for loop. <laughs> so um, yeah, fixed iteration, not a great candidate to use lambdas for. OK. Um, binding. So the binding API is the nice little fluent interface created for JavaFX. Um, you know, again, this is a fairly new API, and there's not anything that's particularly good to use lambdas for this. But this is, you know, when you hover over the circles, this is how it gets a stroke width of four. So it um, makes the, the circles appear a little thicker. Um, and event handlers. So JavaFX has lots of event handlers. I'll give you a, I'll give you a hint. They all have a single method on the interface. So what can we do with this? Is that a lambda expression? Exactly. <laughs> All right, that, that, that deserves a sticker. Oh, by the way, um, <laughs> so I, I brought a bunch of stickers for you guys. Um, so at the end, just come up and grab one off the desk, but pass it back to him. <laughs> you know, nobody else was going to say the obvious thing, so I, we, need, we need people who are willing to, to say things which are painfully obvious. Yeah, so since it's a single method interface, all of the existing JavaFX event handlers just magically work with Lambda expressions. You don't need inner class anymore. It, besides being slightly shorter syntactically, it also has the side benefit where it doesn't generate a... Um, it, it doesn't generate a new class during compilation time. So whenever you create an inner class, if you look at your, your um, jars or your, your bytecode, which gets generated, you get a whole bunch of you know, funky dollar sign classes added everywhere because it statically compiles it. Lambdas use invoke dynamics, so it doesn't have to actually add an extra class every time you use them, which is nice. Application code in your because if you're query. kind of forcing to make an, an inner method, you can actually easily refactor it out later to a different class. So this will uh, actually, well, this refactor you can step. you can um, pass lambda expressions around. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to, you could you know assign this to. You could have a function which creates the lambda expression. You could have it. I wouldn't recommend it, but you could have a static variable which has a lambda expression. So you can, you know, refactor and move the lambda expressions around pretty easily. Um, but, you know, the main, the main advantage is it's syntactically shorter where you're going to do an inline expression. Um, you can also, if you want, you can also do an inner class. So this doesn't preclude you from using inner classes. Could I assign the lambda expression to a variable? Uh, yeah, so the question is, can you assign a lambda expression to a variable? And you can. <laughs> Just, um, so the type of the parameter here is a uh, event, a mouse, mouse event handler, I think. So, mount, I forget the exact class name, but something like mouse event handler. And you do mouse event handler variable name equals lambda expression. And then you can use that variable anywhere you would normally pass in a, um, um, a lambda expression. Yeah? How do you specify a lambda expression type? Type. Yeah. OK. So the way you do the type of a lambda expression is using a functional interface. 
So remember I mentioned functional interfaces, single method interfaces. That's how you specify the types of linear lambda expressions. All right. Any other questions? Ends. Our last one. So this is the code which animates the circles and moves them around the screen and does all that stuff. Um, so what do we do with this one? For each. Okay, another sticker. <laughs> who, who, <laughs> who was the <coughs> obvious person here? <laughs> all right, good job. Yeah, so you can um, simply use a for each here. And it's a great example of for each because in this case it actually makes sense and it shortens your code. Um, and you know, in general, this is a good way of operating with collections. And you can kind of chain things together using streams, which we'll talk about in a sec. So next example is going to be a visual one. We're going to create a little game a little retro video game using um, lambda expressions and the, the elements in the game will kind of demonstrate the streams API. So if you've never seen the streams API, this will be a chance to, to check it out. Hey, Werner. So, so our um, Werner is going to show some stuff as well. I don't know quite yet, what yet. <laughs> So after I do the Lambda stuff, maybe before we do devices, we'll, um, we'll do a short thing with Werner and show something cool for 15 minutes or so. Um, oh, so yeah, so here's how you generate streams. Let me show you the application first that we're going to play around with. Stuff. Well, and this one for now. Okay, so a really simple example. It's about you know five or six hundred lines of code. You have a little character that you can sprite walk around with, and we're going to add a bunch of elements to the to the background. But you know this is the main file. There's only three classes in this entire file. The main file where we're going to add elements to the scene. Um, sprite view handles the animation of our little character. So for example, to, um, to animate Mary around the scene, all we do is update the viewport of um, the image for the character. And um, we have like a little sprite, you know, pixelated graphic for the character. Um, horizontally is our, our walking animation. Vertically is facing different directions. And so if you look at the, the code for sprite view, all it does is it sets the viewport to a rectangle and then it binds the, um, the, the size of the rectangle to the, the width and the height of the, um, it moves, it moves a, a little square around to pick different parts of the, of the image. Um, and then it adds a direction and a frame listener so that it'll update this whenever you, um, you know, move your um, mouse or move your, move your character's direction or you um, changing frames in the animation loop, which is here. So this changes the, um, the frame from 0, 1, 2, 1. So really simple to create a game in JavaFX like this. Um, a lot less work than it probably was in the days of anyone have an Atari? Yeah. I think they did a lot more work than this to create their sprites. Yeah. But, you know, we like, we like pixels, so big pixels. And the first thing we're going to add into the scene is going to be a little bit of code to do generating of um, collections. So there's a few ways you can get a stream. Um, you can take any collection. You can call it .stream or .parallel stream, and that will give you a, a collection. You can take a set of objects in a comma-separated list and call streams.of, and that gives you a, a stream of a static set of objects. Um, in stream.range will give you a numeric set of, of items. So, um, you know, for example, if we, before if we could have used in stream.range and map, which I'll talk about later, to create our list of circles if we wanted to, rather than using generate and limit. And then you could also use 
iterate, which is another way kind of like generate, except rep, where generate would create a, an infinite list of objects and it, um, they'd all be the same. With iterate, you have a seed value and then you have a lambda expression which takes the previous item that got generated. So that way you can modify each item slightly as you're going and generating your, your infinite set. So for example, this case would create like a rainbow set of objects in the stream. Okay, so we're gonna use iterate and create some barn animals. And the way the barn is gonna work is we're going to first get the, the tail of the previous list. Um, so if the list is empty, we'll just take the, the shepherd, Mary. Otherwise, we're going to take the last animal. And then we're gonna pass that into iterate as the tail and then call the lamb constructor via method reference to the constructor. And the lamb constructor takes a single parameter which is the previous animal, the animal you're following. So this way we can chain our animals together and have them follow each other around. Look good? All right, so. Here's our, our barn. And you can see the barn has a, you know, barn image, a constructor which just passes that image up, and then a visit method with exactly the same code in the slide. And let's give that a try. All right. Voila. <laughs> and now we have sprite walking lambs. So, iterate. What happens if we go back to the barn again? <laughs> That's what we'd expect. Yeah. Okay, and no collision detection. We're just happy walking on top of our sheep. All right, so the next thing we're going to try is using the filter function. Oops. Using the um, filter function to modify the elements of the stream. So the way the filter function works is it takes a predicate lambda. Predicate takes the object in the stream and then returns true or false. Um, filter is a function on the streams API, which if it's true, the element stays in the stream. If it's false, it removes it from the stream. So this is a nice way to um, remove elements from the stream. And um, so here's an example, attendees.filter a where a.getAge is greater than equal to Java 1.8. So that would be the equivalent of, um, what's, the, what's the drinking age here in Germany? 18. 16? It depends on the train. <laughs> okay, yeah, but no, no toddlers. All right, so speak, speaking of kids, um, so I, I ran some workshops for DevOps for Kids using this basic game as an example. Um, I figured this out to my daughter. She's 10 and she likes, this is the only one of my presentations she actually likes. <laughs> so that means this is good for kids. Um, so I set them up with a Raspberry Pi and they had the game running on the Raspberry Pi and then they could make little modifications to the game. So like, you know, they liked changing the size of the fox or um, changing the color of the sheep. The rainbow was one of their favorite things to play around with. Um, and we did a workshop in the Netherlands and also in the Bay Area with some kids. So, you know, something good if you're, if you're um, interested to get involved in doing stuff like this. Um, there's a DevOps for Kids website and they're starting new chapters, you know, in different parts of the world to try to teach kids education. And there's a bunch of workshops like, um, you know, Now Robot Workshop and this one for doing Raspberry Pi gaming and then another one that Arun does on modding Minecraft using Bucket Server. What's the recommended minimum age for that? Okay, so recommended minimum age would be um, 10 or above in my experience. Um, usually like, I don't know, in the, in, the, in the US, there's first through fifth grade is elementary school and then sixth through 
eighth is middle school. So usually middle schoolers are a good age. And that's kind of 10 to 12. Um, and, it, and kids younger, they have trouble typing and following stuff, so it's a little bit harder to work with them to get attention. And then kids in high school, typically they, they have some computer experience at school, so it's, it's less of a kind of a level playing field. Some of them are going to be really good and get ahead, and then other kids, um, it's completely new and they haven't done it before, so it's a little bit harder to, to arrange the right levels and get the right thing going. But I think kind of, you know, middle school is a perfect age. Okay, and yeah, they loved playing with the rainbow. So the way this works is it filters on the stream and then goes off of the filtered list and then changes the color of the, um, the animals. So it's filtering on a modulus to get only every fourth animal and then coloring every fourth animal, either yellow, cyan, or green, um, and white is null. So that's the last color you'll see. Yeah, so this is null for white. Um, and the set color function is pretty generic. It just uses a JavaFX color adjustment and then plays around with the hue value. All right, so let's give that a try. Okay, we got some lambs. And colorful lambs now. <laughs> All right, so what happens if we get more guys in the barn again? Will they be colored or plain? All right, we can try. <laughs> plain, but we can fix that. Take them back. There, now they're all colored. And you know, going back on it doesn't do anything because we're just coloring the same color. All right, so that's an example of filtering. But besides doing filtering in the, um, using the streams function, there's also a bunch of convenience methods added to the collections class, which take predicates and do common things. For example, um, remove if removes elements that match the predicate. You can use replace all to filter and replace. And then um, collection, observable collection filtered, which is on the JavaFX API is a good way to filter your collection. Um, and then the resulting filtered list is also observable. So it keeps the observability going. Are these unique pencil methods um, operating on a copy of the original collection or on the, or on the original collection itself? Yeah, OK. That is a good question. So um, in the case of the collections methods, they actually act on the collection. So like collections.removeIf will actually remove them from the collection. If you wanted to you know, get a copy, you could do collection.streams.filter and then do a, you know, a um, collect on that to get back a new collection, which is distinct. Um, yeah, and you can see here, we're just removing it and it modifies the list directly to remove elements. So in this case, we're going to implement a church. Um, and the folks in the church, they're, um, they're very picky about their animals, so they only want the, the pure animals. And we're going to take them, and we're going to um, you know, do, do a good service and feed the homeless. So meals, and then get the animals, filter them by pure, and then get the size. And we're going to increment the counter and then remove them from the list. So single lambda expression. Actually, you know, the earlier question about how to use variables and lambda expressions, this is a good example of that, where it's assigning the lambda expression to a variable and then reusing it in two places. Well, it's pure in this case, like, what? Racially pure? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> so I think I was giving this presentation in, um, where is it? Atlanta um, at DevNexus. And um, you know, I, don't, I don't know if you guys um, are familiar with US geography, but Atlanta is kind of deep south in the US. So there's, there's lots of you know, a history of kind of racial, racial issues. And um, actually, folks like the presentation, but my, my wording, one of my co-presenters tapped me on the shoulder afterwards like, you know, you really shouldn't have used colored. <laughs> well, the other thing about pure that will come to my mind was what happened in Copenhagen with the 
graph that they actually thought the DNA would be uh, not pure or would be mixed up. Yeah, okay, so no, no religious or ethnic. Um, or, yeah, yeah, that's nothing of that. This is a kid-friendly game. All right, so here's our church. Um, okay, it's got some lambs, and we will appropriately change their colors. Notice the phrasing. Yeah. And then, voila, two served. Now, um... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure they, they did an appropriate um, purification on them. Okay, and we can get rid of some more of them. But this, you can see this is going to take quite a while to um, kill all of our animals off. So we'll fix that problem later because we need a more efficient way to, um, to, to get rid of our animals. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you're going to be up here next quarter. <laughs> It'll be your turn. All right, so rainbow, next, or church rather, next one's going to be the chicken coop, and this is a good way of describing a map operation. So maps, and this is where you get into more of the power of the lambda expression. Maps take a stream of one type and then convert it to a stream of another type of object. So, in this example, we are, we're mapping from um, whatever type of animal we have in the list and then mapping to eggs using the egg constructor. And then to make sure that we keep the chain together for the following, passing in whatever the animal was previously following to the, the new eggs which we're adding in. So it gets appropriately, you know, chained. All right. So, there's actually a second way we can implement this using a method reference. So, what sort of method reference would we use? X colon colon. X colon colon. New. New. Okay, so constructor method reference. That's, that's half right because you, you notice the constructor we're passing in, not SV, we're passing in SV.getFollowing. So we first need to construct to a map of what we're following using the, um, a get following, a reference to the get following method. And then you get a stream of whatever animal you were following. And then you can use the constructor method reference and then call the constructor for each of those. <laughs> All right, so you, do you guys like this one or this one better? Who likes the lambda form? Okay, and then who, who likes the method reference? <laughs> All right, so yeah, if you said the second, then you're a hardcore lambda geek. <laughs> um, but the first one, I think, is a little bit re more readable for most Java developers. It's a little more obvious what, what it's doing without kind of thinking about it too hard. I'm still stuck. Your sheep are multiplying by an x. The sheep are what? By an x. They're multiplying by an x. Oh, so yeah, you're, you're wondering why they turn into eggs, right? So the new new five. Yeah, so this, this doesn't have to make sense. <laughs> that's, that's the answer. Okay, so here's our chicken coop implementation. Um, the two different forms. We'll use the second one with the double method reference. And if you look at the, um, well, if you look at the eggs constructor, it takes in what it's following. Okay, so we got our new chicken coop slightly off screen. And eggs. 
And just to, just to show how religious we are, we're going to um, color our eggs for Easter. <laughs> so do you think the churchgoers will? No, no colored eggs. Only the, only the um, pure eggs. All right, so that's an example of map, but um, probably a little slightly more difficult concept is flat map, which is like map, except it operates on a, a stream of streams. So the way flat, flat map works is it expects a lambda expression which is going to return back rather than mapping from an object to an object, mapping from an object to a stream. And then you end up with a stream of streams, right? Because for every object you've now replaced it with a stream. And then flat map will ma flatten the stream of streams into a stream of objects. Um, the resulting stream can be of different size than the original one because you might have, for example, multiple elements getting added for each item. So to illustrate this, we're going to hatch our eggs. So if you remember, the little sprite had three eggs in it. And then when we step on the, the nest, our eggs will hatch and we'll get chickens. Even our lamb eggs give us chickens. It doesn't have to make sense. So we'll get three chickens in a stream, and then we'll use flat map to flatten that into a stream of chickens rather than a stream of stream of chickens. All right, so here's our nest using flat map. And then the, the hatch function simply uses iterate and gives us back a list of um, a stream of three chickens. And then we're going to flatten this, you know, using flat map. So let's give this a try. All right, so now we got some eggs and chickens. So a lot more chickens than eggs, or chickens than lambs we started with. And um, one of the things when the kids play with this, they, their favorite thing to do with this is, <laughs> and this, doesn't, this doesn't stop. They just keep going <laughs> and getting more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a biblical reference. <laughs> and this, this shows you that it's quite performance to, um, you know, like your old Atari probably couldn't handle this many sprites. All right, so we, let's see how many we have. We're going to go to the church. Oh, bam. 1,944 <laughs> meals served. So JavaFX is quite performant, um, and it uses a 3D acceleration as well for accelerating sprites. Um, probably the biggest cost is just object creation and destruction in the JVM. Um, but you can do quite, quite efficient stuff with um, you know, using streams and then using a visual representation in JavaFX. Why was there what? Skip, skip one. Skip one in this? Yep. OK, so the way um, iterate works is you give it a seed value, right? Oh, sorry. You give it a seed value, and then you, um, you iterate and limit. Or you, you iterate, and it gives you an infinite list. Um, the first element in the iterate is actually the seed gets returned back as part of the output. And then you start getting the items you generate. So skip one will skip the seed value, which is returned back in the stream. And then we're limiting it to three chickens. All right, so last one. So I mentioned earlier that we, we need a better way to get rid of our animals, which is not picky about what it's going to eat. So we're going to implement a fox using a reduce function. So reduce uses a binary operator. It 
the binary operator takes two values and returns back one. So re recursively applying this across the stream will result in a single value, and it's great for things like um, sums or multiplications or any sort of aggregation function where you want to get a single element out of the list. So this first maps the list of animals to a list of numbers. Um, each of the animals has a scale. Um, I think lambs are slightly bigger than chickens or something like that. And then we use um, reduce with zero as the seed value and then a sum function where it's going to add up all the elements in the, um, in the list. And finally use that sum to increase the scale of the fox and then we clear out the animals. All right, so what should we feed the fox? What's he hungry for? Anyone? Colored, colored lambs? Okay. Let's give him some colored lambs. Just the colored ones or also the white ones? Just the colored ones. And yum yum. Okay, so he's slightly off screen, but he, he grows. <laughs> and again, this is something the kids love doing. They, they get him as big as possible, and eventually he just, he gets so big he's off screen. <laughs> okay, so that was a, a quick example of um, Java Lambdas. Um, you can find more information about the code on GitHub. So I've posted the, the project in GitHub at my um, repo, Steve on Java. And the project is Mary Had a Little Lambda. And um, you know some more information about my blog and the Night Hacking Tour and all that stuff. So I think what we're going to do is we will now switch to, to Werner's. We're going to do a short interview on something. And then after that, we'll... Um, We'll show some of the demos I have up here for Java Embedded. And then um, give out prizes. So, you know, stickers. And I also have a Raspberry Pi to give out to someone lucky. So we'll think of an appropriate way of raffling that off. All right, get up here, Werner. Oh, you should put your laptop on top of this. Is Facebook mistaken or is it your birthday today?